makers of Chase and Sanborn coffee, the blend that is friendship in a cup, presents the Chase and Sanborn Hour. And your host, Rudy Valley. This is Rudy Valley saying hi ho and welcome to another Chase and Sanborn hour. Hi ho, hi ho, it's Rudy Valley ho, ho, ho. Bravatsima, Charlie, bravatsima. Yes. The rhyme is good and the reason, of course, is obvious. Yeah, I thought it was rather well put myself. Gee, it's good to see you again, Rudy. Thank you, Charlie, and it's good to see you, too. And all my other friends, Edgar Bergen, Dorothy Lemoore, and Robert Armbruster. And as one guest to another, I'd like to say greetings to lovely Jean Arthur, irrepressible Vera Vague and baritone Lansing Hatfield. Speaking of greetings, we hope that you welcome Chase and Sanborn Coffee to your home as enthusiastically as you have always received this show. Very nicely done, Rudy. Trey Superb. I uh, gather it meets with your approval, Mr. McCarthy. Oh, definitely, Mr. Valley. And if you should need any help, I want you to feel free to call on me. <laughs> I appreciate your giving me your valuable advice and time. Oh, that's all right. You know, my time is your time. <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> so, Charlie, if you'll retire, or oh, just temporarily, mind you, yeah. Dorothy Lamour and I have a song to sing. All in favor, say aye. Aye! Not hearing any no's, I suggest we take it away. It's all yours, Bob. <laughs> Every night should be filled with beautiful music and starlight all over the sky. Let's travel along by singing a song. All in favor, say I. Every day should be gay. Let's work just a little, no more than enough to get by. Make living worthwhile by wearing a smile. Favor, say I. Too much business, hurry, hurry, too much trouble, worry, worry. There's a million other things I could think of. Chasing money, nothing to it. Oh, it's funny how we do it when the only thing that matters is love. Everyone should agree to re-elect laughter without wanting ten reasons why. Back all of your votes with musical notes. All in favor, say I. much business, hurry, hurry, too much trouble, worry, worry, there's a million other things I could think of, chasing rainbows, nothing to it, oh, it's funny how we do it when the only thing that matters is love. Everyone should agree to re-elect laughter without wanting ten reasons why, back all of your votes with musical notes, all in service there Many critical ears have passed judgment on and many critical hands have applauded the vocal abilities of our visiting troubadour tonight, Lansing Hatfield, baritone. Our own ears and hands join in this well-earned praise. Mr. Hatfield, it's my pleasure to give you your first Chase and Sanborn send-off. Mr. Valley, it's my pleasure to be given my first Chase and Sanborn send-off by you. With courtesies thus exchanged, Lansing Hatfield sings the riff song from Rudolph Rimmel's operetta, the Desert Song. Over the ground, there can be sound. It is the drum, drum, drum of hook deep in the sand. Oh, if you're sure. It is the thunder of the shadow and his band And all who plunder learn to understand The cry of hope So we sing as we are riding home It's a time you'd best be hiding low 
It means the rifts are abroad. Oh, before you get in the sword. Oh, that's the sound that comes to warn you so. In the night or early morn, you know. If you're the red shadow's soul, a rift will strike with a blow that brings you up. Oh, it's a time you'd best be hiding low. It means the rips are abroad. Oh, before you bet them the sword. Oh, that's the sound that comes to warn you so. In the night or early morning, you know. If you're the red shadow soul, a rips will strike with a blow that brings you. I'm sure that I shall never see a place as nice as Durgan's knee. Oh, that's very nice, very charming, Charlie. What are you trying to do? Talk your way back into Edgar's heart? No, no. Just to his knee. Oh, yes. I, uh, I heard about your little disagreement. Oh, did you, Rudy? Uh, did you hear? How did you hear about it? I listened to your show last week in Palm Springs. Oh, Good. D did you like it? Oh, it was very funny, Charlie. Oh, thank you. Thank that, that Mortimer was excellent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> et tu, Rudy? Sorry, Charlie. Oh, Rudy, you don't know... You don't know what I've been through the past few weeks. <laughs> suffer, 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 suffer. <laughs> no one will ever know how I've suffered. I won't tell them. It's none of their business. Well, what's bothering you, Charlie? Well, uh, my future, mostly. Your future? What makes that so hopeless? Well, my past, mostly. <laughs> well, Charlie, you know they say trouble always comes in bunches. Yeah, yeah. Well, they sure ganged up on me. I was doing all right until the great Frederick came along. And then Mortimer set in. <laughs> haven't you come to some understanding with Edgar yet? No, Rudy, I haven't. He won't even talk to me. Well, he's so cagey, you know. You know how he is. That's really serious. Yeah. Have you tried to make any other contacts? Well, I advertised in the paper. In the paper? Yeah, yeah, under an assumed name, too. Oh, I see. <laughs> I put an ad in a personal column, see, and it read, uh, quote, um, uh, Ventriloquist's assistant at liberty would like to meet first grade high class ventriloquist. Will travel. <laughs> uh, right box 10, see. Mm, that sounds pretty good, Charlie. Uh, you get any answers? Yeah, two. One was from the great Frederick. <laughs> and the other? From Bergen. <laughs> from Bergen? Yeah. What did Edgar have to say? Well, he just wrote, uh, Charlie, haven't you learned your lesson yet? <laughs> that guy is psychic. Seems that way. You'll uh, have to try something else. Yeah, I have. I got an idea now that just can't miss. You see that basket over there? Oh, yes, I noticed that. It's full of letters, isn't it? Two hundred of them. And everyone is to Bergen demanding that he take me back. See? Excellent, excellent. So many letters are bound to impress Edgar. Oh, sure, can't miss now. Hello, Rudy. Hello, Edgar. Oh, hello, Mr. Bergen. What's that? Uh, Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Well, Rudy, it's nice being back together again. Oh, are we back together again? I'm not talking to you. Hardly pays me to open my mouth around here. 
Look, Edgar, I don't like to interfere, but it does seem to me that you're being a little too severe with Charlie. Rudy, all I can say is that I made an appointment with Charlie to be at my office Monday at 2 o'clock to talk over the matter of taking him back. And he didn't show up, nor did he bother to explain his absence. Now, Rudy, I appeal to you. Now, Rudy, I appeal oh, to oh, you. No, 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 you don't. Look here, this is strictly a private quarrel, and far be it for me to be the innocent bystander who gets kicked. Oh. <laughs> well, Charlie... Why weren't you at my office Monday? Oh, Monday. Yes. Uh, Monday, Monday. Uh, oh, I, I don't know. Everything went blank. I see. <laughs> well, haven't you even got an alibi? Uh, yes, I have. Yes, uh-huh. But I warn you, it won't stand much kicking around. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it? Well, you see, I, uh... I came up Tuesday instead. Oh, you did? Yes, I did, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, why didn't you talk to my secretary? I did. Oh, you did? Yeah. And what did she say? Well, she said she was dated up every night this week. Oh, she did. <laughs> well, you know that's wrong. Yes, I tried to tell her that. Yeah. Oh, Charlie, I don't know what to do. Oh, there's a, there's a lot of mail for you, Mr. Bergen. Might give you an idea. That, uh, that basket over there is just full of letters. Don't you want to read some of them? Hundreds of them, eh? Interesting. Yeah. Listen, young man. You're not going to fool me with any of that phony letter stuff. Yeah, you see? There you are, you see? Yeah. How can you stoop so low? I don't know. <laughs> I guess we've been seeing too much of each other lately. <laughs> you know, there's around 200 letters there. All right, so there are 200 letters. Yes. So what? You had them made for around $2 a hundred. No, sir, you're wrong there, Mr. Bergen. Oh, am I? Yes. It was $3 a hundred. $3 a hundred. <laughs> Charlie, I don't know what course to take with you. Oh, take me back, will you, Bergen? Huh? Oh, go ahead. Take me back, huh? Ah, oh, come on. Oh. oh, come on, Bergen. Be a good sport, huh? Well, I want to do what is best for you. Well, then take me back. Ah, oh, take me back. Here. <laughs> Well, what hurts me most, Charlie, is the way you left me. Oh. Ignoring my feelings entirely. Remember, Charlie, when we disregard the value of friendship, we have lost everything. Yeah. Hey, I hate myself. I'm a cad. That's what I am, a cad. <laughs> However, even your experiences with the great Frederick should not be considered a failure. Well, I don't know what else you could call it. <laughs> well, you're no different than the average boy. When you went away, you left because you wanted adventure. Uh-huh. And because you wanted to uh, spread your wings. Yeah, spread my wings, yes. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think I'd make a forced landing in a hot shop. <laughs> but, Charlie, uh -huh. you're impulsive, you're irresponsible, you're selfish, and you have an exaggerated conception of the value of money. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the opinions expressed by Mr. Bergen are entirely his own. <laughs> Mr. Bergen, I don't think you like me as much as you used to. Well, you're mistaken about that, Charlie. Your latest episode has caused me a great deal of worry. It has? Yes. I lie awake night after night thinking of you. Do you, dear? All right. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason why we shouldn't get along much better than we do. Why, no, no, of course not. We have a lot in common. Yes, we have. Trouble is, you won't give me any of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you have your faults and I have mine. I agree with you there. And I'm willing to meet you halfway and admit that I am partly to blame. Well, that's fair enough. And I'll meet you halfway and admit that you are too. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that you've learned one thing about your experiences. What's that? You've learned something about life. Yeah. It is a little complex, isn't it? Yeah. How true, how true. Life is so complicated... That a fellow would be lucky if he wasn't born at all. <laughs> but that seldom happens. <laughs> yes, Charlie, life is very complicated, and Tin Pan Alley is ready to sustain you. The blues are always popular, and ever more popular than when sung by Dorothy L'Amour. So we leave the blue tune, What's New, to Mademoiselle L'Amour. Oh, <laughs> 
haven't changed a bit Handsome as ever, I must admit What's new? How did that romance come through? We haven't met since then Gee, but it's nice to see you again What's new? Probably I'm boring you But seeing you is grand And you were sweet to offer your hand I understand I do Pardon my asking what's new Of course you couldn't know I haven't changed I still love you so traveled west last week, one thing that I saw along the way impressed me. It was the way fresh food is handled. From farmlands, coast to coast, crisp new vegetables, fresh eggs, and milk were being rushed to town. And going through the cities, I saw the trucks that carry another fresh food, coffee. Yes, to provide every city, village, and crossroads with Chase and Sanborn dated coffee at the height of its fine, rich, freshly roasted flavor... We've built modern roasting ovens from coast to coast. You mean there are roasting ovens in every section? Yes, ma'am. No matter where you live, there's a Chase and Sanborn roasting plant within 24 hours of your home. And our rapid fresh food delivery service supplies your grocer from one of the roasting ovens nearest to his store. Well, I can see the coffee must have more flavor that way, freshly roasted. Of course it has. The moment roasting has brought the coffee to the peak of its goodness, it's put in the dated silver package and rushed to the store. It's handled rapidly, like the fresh food it is. And every pound is dated. So I know it's fresh. Yes, ma'am. No package stays in the grocer's store more than ten days. In fact, here in the East, we make deliveries every few days, leaving only enough dated coffee to last until the next delivery. No other nationally sold coffee gives you this assurance of freshness. Then it's no wonder so many people are changing to dated coffee. Especially when you consider this. Rapid delivery plus the date makes costly containers unnecessary. We use the economical silver package instead and pass the saving on to you. Then I actually save money and get richer, fresher coffee. That's it exactly. So, ask for delicious Chase and Sanborn dated coffee in the new silver package tomorrow. To me, one of the most enjoyable things about being an official greeter 
is the very enjoyable function of welcoming lovely visitors, such as our charming guest tonight, Jean Arthur. Miss Arthur adds yet another proud feather to her already befeathered cap by her grand performance in the Columbia picture, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. She appears for us tonight in a radio adaptation of A.A. A. Milner's delightful one-act play, The Artist. With Miss Arthur is Alan Marshall, a most talented young man who has done such fine work for Selznick International Pictures. We present Jean Arthur in The Artist. <laughs> It is 10 o'clock in the morning at the summer home of Mr. Matheson. Evidently, the owner is away, but a girl is there bending over the mail table. She is nervously thumbing through the letters, as if looking for one in particular. She fails to notice a man who enters from the hallway. <clears throat> oh! Oh! Who are you? Hello. I didn't mean to startle you. Yes, but you did. You see, your, your being the wrong person made it particularly startling. Yes, it would make it worse, of course. <laughs> well, I thought you were going to be Mr. Matheson. Oh, Mr. Matheson. No, I'm afraid I'm not. Oh, well, well, it isn't your fault. <laughs> Guess he had the name first, didn't he? <laughs> Was he expecting you? Yes, yes. Uh, that is, uh, no. Whichever you prefer. Thank you very much. I think perhaps it's no. The nose have it. Do you mind if I ask what you're doing here? Well, I might ask you the same thing. Well, um, I live here. Oh, no, you don't. No, Mr. Matheson. I've rented it. Oh. Uh, it's dreadfully hot today, isn't it? <laughs> dreadfully. I don't know when I've been so hot. <laughs> yeah, that, that's hot work, too. What is? That sort of thing, reading people's mail. You... You, are, are you presuming to suggest, Mr... Mr... Bustle. Thank you. Not at all. Uh, shall I put those letters down for you? No. No, thanks. I, I like holding them. I was just going to forward Mr. Matheson's mail for him. May I have it? Oh, are these his letters? Oh, so they are. Oh, dear, I dropped one. How silly of me. I'll get them. There we are. Now, uh, what about the other one? Which one? The one you didn't drop. I think you slipped it into your purse. How quick you are, Mr... Uh... Bustle. Yes, of course. May I have it? No. No, you see, this letter is mine. Is it addressed to you? No. Addressed by me. You see, I wrote it. Oh, you wrote it. You know, Mr. Hustle. Bustle. Mr. Bustle. <laughs> You're very annoying. I'm so sorry, but after all... Oh, I... do you suppose I came here to steal the family jewels? Say... Are you sure you've rented this place? Mr. Matheson was coming back today. Looks very suspicious to me. Well, I can show you the lease if you're interested. And Mr. Matheson did come back this morning. And he left again. I wanted to stay and... Well, here I am. Here we are. And, uh... Now, if you'll give me my letter, I'll be going. Mm, I hate to bring this up, but... There's just one more thing. What do you mean? The law... The law? Yes. You see, once a letter has been through the mail, it doesn't belong to the writer anymore. Oh, you must be wrong. I don't think so. Try thinking so. Sorry, but that's the way it is. Say, you're not a policeman or a judge or anything strict, are you? No, as a matter of fact, I'm an architect. Oh, well, they're never very strict. Wouldn't it help if I ordered a couple of houses? Mm, I'm afraid not. Oh, uh, now, look. Look, if I told you that I wrote that letter on a mad impulse and that I want to get it back before Mr. Matheson reads it, what would you say? I'd say, why on earth didn't you tell me that before? And I'd give you the letter at once. Here, take it. Oh, oh, oh thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Shall we sit down? Yes, let's. <sighs> Have you ever had the mumps? The what? <laughs> mumps, you know, your cheeks puff up like this. No, uh, not recently. Why? Oh, nothing. It was true, you know, about that letter. I was running away. From, uh, Mr. Matheson? Yes. We were engaged. Almost married, you might say. Invitations sent out, presents pouring in, meeting each other's aunts. Well, anyone could run away from a husband, but it takes courage to run away from all that. Yes, I guess it does. But wouldn't it have been pretty hard on Mr. Matheson? But you see, I didn't really love him. 
I tried to, but I just couldn't. I was in love with Henry. Oh, yes, with Henry. And uh, just who is Henry? Well, he's the one I was going to marry at the courthouse this morning. I thought Mr. Matheson should know, so I wrote him last night. Well, this letter you have here? Yes, yes. Well, well, I went to the courthouse. This morning? Exactly. When I got there, what do you think I found? No Henry. That's right. No Henry, just this telegram. You, uh, you want me to read it? Please. Have mumps. Writing, Henry. Well? Well. Well, after all, it wasn't his fault. Well, it wasn't mine. No, but I mean... Mumps. Well, of course, mumps probably didn't improve Henry's appearance, but you wouldn't have to see him until... Well, I mean... I never want to see him again. Oh, that's hardly fair. I don't mind his having them. Anybody might have them. But to to time them so badly... (laughs) I feel rather sorry for Henry. Of course. You men always hang together. You're all alike. Well, not at all. I wouldn't even dream of having mumps on my wedding day. I'm, I'm not that sort of person. Aren't you? Well, of course not. All I meant was, well, I feel sorry for Henry because... because he's lost you. Anyone would be sorry for him. Great big face and a broken heart. His heart isn't broken. No? Mine would be. Oh, yours. But you're different. Well, that's what I keep saying. Different, but still sympathetic with Henry. Wait. You haven't heard the worst. As soon as I read the telegram, I... Well, what could I do? I was staggered. I said to the boy, thank you, thank you, and went home all dazed. And when I got in, the first thing I saw was another telegram. You can imagine how excited I was. Here it is. You uh, want me to read it? Please. Have mumps writing Henry. Have mumps writing Henry. The same mumps? The same mumps. (laughs) Well? Well. Oh, yes, of course. I see what you mean. Look at them. Have mumps writing Henry. Have mumps writing Henry. Doesn't that show you the kind of a man he is? Hmm, methodical. He's probably telegraphed to everyone he knows in just the same words. All over the country, telegrams are being delivered. Have mumps writing Henry. Yes, I, I know, You would have but... thought he'd taken the trouble to put it a little differently in the second telegram. Of uh, sorry, have mumps, or, or sudden bad attack of mumps, or, or even having mumps. But a man who can sit down and write two telegrams exactly the same. But he... Uh... A girl can't marry that sort of a man. Mm-hmm. Especially such a pretty girl. You know, you're rather interesting. Am I? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now, uh, where was I? Oh, yes, that second telegram. Have mumps writing, Henry. Oh, that made me so mad, being the same as the other. I telegraphed back. How funny. So have I, Bettine. And I dashed right down here. Bettine. So you see, having written Mr. Matheson that I was running away with another man, Henry, I mean, and then finding Henry was having mumps, I dashed down here to get the letter back. Bettine, I've heard that name. It's a pretty name, isn't it? Bettine Conway, of course. That's me. Yes, I mailed a letter to you. Oh, wait a minute. No, I didn't. It's still in my pocket. What sort of a letter? Well, this morning, when Mr. Matheson was here, he gave me a letter to mail for him. Here you are. I might have forgotten it forever. This letter hasn't been mailed yet. No. Then it still belongs to Mr. Matheson. That's the law, I believe. Oh, I don't know. It can't matter much. I'm very strict in these affairs. Who gets the stamp? (laughs) Will you keep the letter and give me the stamp? Very well. Very well. We'll see what Mr. Madison has to say. Oh! Bad news? Oh. What's the matter? Oh. Well? Well, I'm jilted. You don't mean... Yes. Mr. Madison was married this morning. Why, that low-down... I don't mind not to pay his rent this week. Oh. Oh, if only he'd got my letter first. I did jilt him first, didn't I? You did, I swear it. Oh, couldn't we draw up a statement of some sort? Look, why not send your letter on to him, just as it is? I have his address. How clever you are. I didn't know architects were like that. Oh, oh, but I can't. Why not? Because my letter to Mr. Matheson says I'm getting married, and I'm not. No, that's right, you're not. It's awkward, isn't it? Oh, why didn't I just jilt him? Without going into the particulars about Henry. Well, Henry. Uh, well, uh, did you mention Henry's name? Not his actual name, but I said I was getting married at once and... Oh, oh, if I could only prove that I jilted Mr. Madison first and... 
Couldn't we steam the letter open, and then I could write another and use the same envelope because it's canceled with yesterday's date, and... and uh, I could make a suggestion. You could what? Get married. Oh, but... Uh, no buts about it. You know, you have the prettiest blue eyes. Do you think so? Yes, I certainly do. In fact, I like everything about you. You know, I think Mr. Matheson and Henry must be crazy, too. You do? Oh, yes, I do. You need someone who really appreciates you. Someone... Well, someone like me, for instance. Ah, uh, are you... Are you proposing to me, Mr... I certainly am. Uh, Bustle. <laughs> Bustle. No, no. Bob. Bettine, I'd like to marry you very much. Will you? Please? You think it would work out? Oh, I know it would. You seem very sure. I am sure. I've never been more sure of anything in my whole life. Bob? Yes? If we're going to forward my letter to Mr. Matheson... <laughs> we'll we'll have to hurry. This is Rudy Valley, and the chase in San Juan Hour continues. For one of the most novel treatments of a love song, the laurel wreath goes to Andre Messager, who, with manuscript in hand and tongue in cheek, wrote the delightful composition long ago in Alcala. Lansing Hatfield presents the humorous evidence. <laughs> Long ago in Alcala, ta-ra-da, ta-ra-da, da 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 there dwelt a bold and bad grandee who used to sail upon the sea, to sail upon the sea, to sail upon the sea, ta-ra-da, ta-ra-da. He loved a maid of Alcala, ta-la-la, ta-la-la-la-la-la-la, for he was fine and frank and free, and she was fair as a maid could be. As a maid could be, ta la la, ta la la. He was a terrible tall Alcady, she was a lovely lady. Alcay, Alcay, Alcani, da, the lovely lady of Alcala, the lady of Alcala, ta la la, ta la la. They met one evening now, ta la ta la ta la ta la ta la He said, sweet maiden, come with me, but she was as toy as a maid should be, as a maid, as a maid, as a maid should be, ta la la ta la la So they sailed away, both he and she, ta la la ta la 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 which was rather odd as it seems to me, for Alcala isn't on the sea. It's nowhere near the sea, ta la la ta la la. Yet to tell the truth, it seems to me, ta la la ta la 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 la. Some songs are very like this, you see. From sensible words, they're often free. They're bald, they're bald as a song can be, ta la la ta la la ta la 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 la. So when you sing such a song as this, ta ra ra ta ra 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 All about a man and a maid and a kiss and a secret and moment and wedded bliss Why, they're all very much like this So long as the tune has the right good swing It doesn't much matter what words you sing ta la la ta la la ta la 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 ta la la ta la la ta la la ta la This evening, we put our best foot forward to greet Vera Vague, that prominent lecturer and club woman whom we all know for her sound opinions. Of course, there's a, a great deal more sound than opinion, but we're behind her anyway. And it's a pleasure to say, welcome, Vera Vague. Thank you very much. Oh, dear, I love this program. I meet more good-looking men. <laughs> you know, uh... 
I'm quite a fan of yours, young man. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. I nearly <laughs> swoon when I hear you sing when the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. Boo, 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 boo. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> just, just a moment, Miss Vague. I'm afraid you're mistaken. I'm not Bing Crosby. Oh. My friends refer to me as Rudy Valley. Oh, well, what do you care as long as you have your strength? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, it is a small world, isn't it? Well, uh, mm. Miss Vague, I understand you're a lecturer of some note and interested in world affairs. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, I've, uh, I've delved deeply into political economy and whatnot, and I'm, I'm firmly convinced that the future of this country lies in the youth of the nation. I think the youth is the, uh... The young men, though. <laughs> what are you doing tonight after the show? <laughs> Who, me? Yes. I, I wonder if you'd like to go to the Hollywood Bowl with me. The Hollywood Bowl? Yes. Why, there's nobody there. Well, that's what I was sort of counting on. <laughs> what am I saying? Uh, well, we better get down to business here, yes, shall I think we? we have. Yes, now, um, as you may have heard, Mr. Valley, I've prepared a, a lecture on American history for this evening. Now, as we all know, America is located in the, uh, the good old USA. Uh, Columbus discovered it. He discovered it in, uh, let me see. Well, it's easy to remember the date by that little poem. Columbus sailed the deep blue sea in 1493. <laughs> or was it hardly a man is now alive in 1495? Well, the date isn't important anyway. We only have Columbus' word for it. You know how these sailors do go on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're an American, aren't you, Mr. Valet? I certainly am. My great-grandfather came over on the Mayflower, first trip. Well, how long ago you stay? <laughs> you know, Miss Vague, a horrible thought has just struck me. Oh, what's that? I don't think you know a thing about American history. Well, I certainly do, young man. Then perhaps you can tell me in what year they fought the War of 1812. Why, certainly. War of 1812? Of course. Well, when was it? Well, it was in the, it's about... Don't tell me now that the War of 1812. <laughs> See, isn't that, that silly? It's right on the tip of my tongue. The War of 1812, Miss Vague, was fought in 1812. Well, that's what I thought, but it sounded too easy. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, young man, don't you heckle me about my information. I'll have you know I was educated in Oxford and Eton. Perhaps uh, you could sue them. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. I, um... I, I don't know whether you know it or not, Mr. Valet, but my uncle was a fine soldier. Really? Yes, he was, even though... They did court-martial him for being a coward. A coward? Yes. What did he do? Oh, well, it was just a misunderstanding. In the thick of the battle, they thought he was deserting. But he wasn't at all. He was just going way back so he could get a good running start when the captain yelled charge. Great fighters, you babes. Not bad, you valleys. <laughs> Oh, seriously, Mr. Valley, the most exciting thing in American history was the Battle of Bunker Hill, don't you think? Oh, my, what a stirring event that was. It just makes my American blood curl. What? Burl. What? <laughs> anyway, can't you just picture General, uh, whatchamacallit, coming around the mountain with his Bunker Hill uh, billies? Uh... <laughs> Every one of them, every single one of them, loaded to the guns. With loaded guns. <laughs> Where am I? What's the ante? I... Keep, a, keep a tight grip on yourself, Miss Vague. You're the spirit of 76. Who's 76? Oh, I see what you mean. Pardon. Well, anyway, there's nothing that stirs me like American history. It, it's so... Uh, so... American. I, uh, I always feel a little touched. Yes, I think you are. <laughs> a little. Oh, well, that's nice of you. Now, wait a minute, young man. I don't like your attitude. American history is American history, no matter what I say. You say. After all, who are you to insult my historical background? Well, perhaps because I happen to have a little historical background myself, Miss Vague, perhaps you'd be interested in knowing that my great-grandfather fought with General Braddock. 
My grandfather fought with General Grant, and my father fought with General Pershing. My goodness, what's the matter? Can't your folks get along with anybody? <laughs> In all modern songwriting history, there is no more successful to duo than my good friends Richard Rogers and Larry Hart. The, for the George Abbott show, Too Many Girls, the boys have supplied a refreshingly new treatment on an old theme called I Didn't Know What Time It Was. I'd like to voice their ideas on the subject. Once I was young, yesterday perhaps, danced with all the girls, but the other chaps. Once I was young, but never was naive. I thought I had a trick or two up my imaginary sleeve. And now I know I was naive. I didn't know what time it was Then I met you Oh, what a lovely time it was How sublime it was too I didn't know what day it was You held my hand Warm as the month of May it was and I'll say it was grand, grand to be alive, to be young, to be mad, to be yours alone. Grand to see your face, feel your touch, hear your voice, say I'm all your own. I didn't know what year it was. Life was no prize I wanted love and there it was Shining out of your eyes I'm wise For I know what time it is now Twilight in the desert is beautiful, isn't it? I knew it would be, but with you here, it's indescribably perfect. I never dreamed that anything like this existed. And now I don't want it to ever end. And yet I know that it must. But I'll always have the exquisite memory of all this to keep with me. I wonder if you can realize how, how wonderful it is having you here with me. You ask if I'm happy? Happy. It's grand to be alive, to be young, to be mad, to be yours alone. Grand to see your face, feel your touch, hear your voice, say I'm all your own. I didn't know what year it was. Life was no prize I wanted love and there it was Shining out of your eyes I'm wise For I know what time it is Westward, said George Barclay, the course of empire takes its way. And westward across this continent move the pioneers, setting up outposts of civilization. Those outposts are thriving cities now, centers of population, serving their districts with all the good things of the world. And in districts from coast to coast, we've built new modern roasting plants for Chase and Sanborn dated coffee. 
No matter where you live, you get this superb blend at the very peak of its rich, fresh flavor. Because it's freshly roasted. That's right. Your own grocer will tell you... A rapid, fresh food delivery system brings that fine coffee to the store from one of the nearest roasting ovens. And every package is dated. Yes, sir. Dated right on the front of the silver package. So our customers know the coffee is freshly roasted and full of flavor. No pound stays in the store more than ten days. We see to that. In fact, our trucks leave only enough freshly roasted coffee to last a few days until the next delivery. That's handling coffee like fresh food, which is exactly what this fine coffee is. Yes, from the time it's taken out of the roasting oven full of delicious flavor, coffee of this high quality should be handled rapidly. And it is. It's packed at once. Put right in the dated silver packages and sent out to the stores. And all this speed in handling, plus the date on every pound, does away with the need for expensive containers. And that saves money. Exactly. We use the economical silver package and pass the saving along to your customers. And they appreciate it, too. It's the most popular coffee we've ever sold. Try it tomorrow. Get delicious, freshly roasted Chase and Sanborn coffee in the new dated silver package. <laughs> oh, boy, boy, boy. <laughs> My time is your time. <laughs> Mortimer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mustn't sing. Well, why not? They were playing. Yeah, I know, but that must make makes no difference. <laughs> Now, see, what were you doing back there in the corner with those earphones on? Oh, I was tuning my crystal set. Oh, I see. Tuning your crystal set. Yep. My. And why bring a radio set to a studio? Well, I ain't going to miss hearing this program just because I'm on it. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that Charlie McCarthy. Gosh, who is he? He's funny. Oh, I, he's funny? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not funny. Oh, no. I'm more the serious type. I see. <laughs> well, Mortimer, I think it's time that you met all your friends on the show. I don't know. They don't want to meet me. Oh, well, why not? Oh, I don't amount to nothing, hardly. Oh. Of course you do. Jean, wouldn't you like to meet Mortimer? Oh, yes, Edgar. Mortimer's such a nice boy. Oh, gosh, weird. <laughs> I'm just a small town boy. Oh, that doesn't matter, Mortimer. Who knows? Someday you might be president. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, Mr. Snurd goes to Washington. <laughs> oh, geez. Well, uh, then you know this is Gene Arthur. Yeah, uh, sure. Pleased to meet you, Mom. I'm very glad to know you, Mortimer. Oh, gosh, she's pretty. <laughs> I was hoping I'd meet one of them actresses. You were? Why? <laughs> because I brung something. A present, sort of, kind of. <laughs> I brung it all the way from Snurdville, just for a girl like you. Oh, mm. isn't that thoughtful? Yeah. What did you bring me? A dozen eggs. <laughs> <laughs> A dozen eggs. Mm. Oh, how lovely. Yes, Mom. And they're from your farm? Yep. We make them there. <laughs> yes, you know, Jean, uh, uh, Mortimer's farm is uh, two miles south of Snurdville. And they have cows and chickens. They've got hogs, too. And hogs, too, you know. Do you raise any corn and potatoes? No, just hogs. Well, you prefer raising hogs. Yep, Mom, yes. Why? Well, <laughs> You don't have to hoe hogs, no. no. <laughs> I'll bet you Snurdville is a right big town by cracky. Hey, Mortimer? Yeah. Well, we don't say by cracky. <laughs> <laughs> That's very small townish. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got a grocery store in Snurdville. Imagine that. Snurdville has a grocery store. Yeah, it's hard to believe, you. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I go for excitement. Excitement? Yeah. In a grocery store? Sure, sure. Well, I swan. Yeah. What do you do there? I watch the man run the new bacon slicer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, riggedy. <laughs> 
Oh, boy, Ricky Diggy. <laughs> that is exciting. Yep, 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 Mom. When I get tired of that, you know what I do? No, what? Uh, should I tell her? <laughs> I think it's safe. I go down to the depot about seven o'clock. <laughs> oh, you go down to the depot? Depot. Uh, depot, yeah. Then. <laughs> about seven o'clock. Yeah, and I'll watch the 410 come in. Oh, I... <laughs> Has Nerdville got a nice depot, Mortimer? Yep, yep, ma'am. We got a brand new one. You see that, Gene? A new depot. Oh, the old one wasn't good enough, was it, Mortimer? Oh, it weren't that so much, but uh, the boys whittled it down. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yep, they whittled and whittled and whittled. <laughs> uh, no depot, I. <laughs> Well, Mortimer, it's been awfully nice meeting you. I don't know how I'm going to thank you for those dozen eggs you brought me. Oh, Shouch, don't thank me. The chickens did all the work. <laughs> Edgar, would it be all right if I kissed him? Oh, no, you don't. No. I know all about you actresses. I get around a little, all right. No, not Mortimer. What's the matter? Oh, no, no, it's so dumb. No, what's the matter? I wasn't born tomorrow. Oh, no. No, no. Oh, go on, Mortimer. I can still see the hayseed in your hair. No, oh, that ain't hayseed. Them wild oats. <laughs> oh, Mortimer, you sure are a rip-snorting humdinger. Yeah. And I'll always have these eggs to remember you by. <gasps> now, isn't that nice? Yeah. Isn't Jean nice? Yeah. Aren't, I, aren't you glad you met her, too? Yeah. Well, yeah. Boy, this is fun. Yeah. Now, uh, would you like to meet Dorothy Lamour? Oh, gosh, another girl? Yeah. Oh, uh, she don't want to meet... Oh, boy, 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 boy. She don't want to meet... Me. <laughs> Why, I certainly do, Morty. Oh, she called me by my first name, hardly. <laughs> Isn't Mortimer Q, Dorothy? He certainly is, Edgar. Oh, sis, I am not. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, my, what a pretty checkered shirt and what a snappy yeah. suit you've got on, Mortimer. I'm wearing shoes, too. Yeah. <laughs> Why? You know, Mortimer, you're as sweet a boy as I've ever met. Yeah. You're so shy and uh, so polite and yeah. so different. Yeah. I'm ignorant, too. <laughs> well, I think you're just too darling for words, Mortimer. <laughs> sure. You won't run away, will you? Nope, Mom, nope, nope. All right. Uh -huh. See you later. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, Mortimer, would you like to meet our conductor, Robert Ambrister? Nope, nope. Well, why not? <laughs> I'd rather meet Dorothy Lamour again. Easy country, boy. <laughs> Lansing Hatfield sings the Pilgrim Song, a musical collaboration of the famous, lyric by Leo Tolstoy, music by Tchaikovsky. My blessing fall on this fair world, on Mount Valley, forest, ocean. The clarion winds in ceaseless motion, and heaven's blue banner high on the first. And blessed to the staff that hither bore me, the arms that helped me on my way, the boundless plain that lies before me, the glowing morn, By which I wander shows glorious golden 
bathed in the light. No blade of grass that glistens yonder, but seems a star from heaven's high. Oh, my time, my exultation, to all the world this joy imparts. Would I might clasp the whole creation, lovers as strangers, oh, There is one worldwide organization which in war and in peace, in good times and in bad, and especially in times of disaster, is ready every hour of every day, in every year, to help those who need help, regardless of race, creed, color, or nationality. The Red Cross. The annual roll call of the Red Cross is now in progress throughout the United States and Canada. It is the privilege of every one of us to support this cause, and we will not fail. For the cause of the Red Cross is the cause of humanity. With the show over, there are lots of ways to say goodnight. One could say just plain, so long. Or one could say it the flowery way that Shakespeare did. Good night, good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be tomorrow. But whether you prefer the plain or flowery way of saying good night, we all agree on the best way to say a good cup of coffee, and that is Chase and Sanborn. Next Sunday, I shall again have the pleasure of presenting all your friends, Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, Dorothy Lamour, Robert Armbruster, and the Chase and Sandman Orchestra. And in the nature of a happy reunion, we shall be joined by our young, old friend, Donald Dixon. Our guests at the festivities will be George Raft and Alan Mowbray. Until we all meet again next Sunday, this is Rudy Valley anticipating another I Hope. <laughs> Next week, another big Chase and Sanborn hour. George Raff, Rudy Valley, Donald Dixon, Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, Dorothy Lamour, Alan Mowbray, and Robert Armbruster in the Chase and Sanborn Orchestra. Heard on this program, the riff song from Sigmund Romberg's Desert Song and the big show by Jerome Kern. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company. Movement of some sort? Look, why not send your letter on to him, just as it is? I have his address. How clever you are. I didn't know architects were like that. Oh, oh, but I can't. Why not? Because my letter to Mr. Matson says I'm getting married, and I'm not. No, that's right, you're not. It's awkward, isn't it? Oh, why didn't I just jilt him without going into the particulars about Henry? Well, Henry. Uh, well, uh, did you mention Henry's name? Not his actual name, but I said I was getting married at once, and oh, oh, if I could only prove that I jilted Mr. Madison first, and 
Couldn't we steam the letter open, and then I could write another and use the same envelope because it's canceled with yesterday's date, and... and uh, I could make a suggestion. You could what? Get married. Oh, but... Uh, no buts about it. You know, you have the prettiest blue eyes. Do you think so? Yes, I certainly do. In fact, I like everything about you. You know, I think Mr. Matheson and Henry must be crazy, too. You do? Oh, yes, I do. You need someone who really appreciates you. Someone... Well, someone like me, for instance. Uh, are you... Are you proposing to me, Mr... I certainly am. Uh, Bustle. <laughs> Bustle. No, no. Bob. Bettine, I'd like to marry you very much. Will you? Please? You think it would work out? Oh, I know it would. You seem very sure. I am sure. I've never been more sure of anything in my whole life. Bob? Yes? I don't think you like me as much as you used to. Well, you're mistaken about that, Charlie. Your latest episode has caused me a great deal of worry. It has? Yes. I lie awake night after night thinking of you. Do you, dear? All right. <laughs> There's no reason why we shouldn't get along much better than we do. Why, no, no, of course not. We have a lot in common. Yes, we have. Trouble is, you won't give me any of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you have your faults and I have mine. I agree with you there. And I'm willing to meet you halfway and admit that I am partly to blame. Well, that's fair enough. And I'll meet you halfway and admit that you are too. <laughs> well, I'm sure that you've learned one thing about your experiences. What's that? You've learned something about life. Yeah. It is a little complex, isn't it? Yeah. How true, how true. Life is so complicated... That a fellow would be lucky if he wasn't born at all. <laughs> but that seldom happens. <laughs> yes, Charlie, life is very complicated, and Tin Pan Alley is ready to sustain you. The blues are always popular, and ever more popular than when sung by Dorothy L'Amour. So we leave the blue tune... Wh Wanted to uh, spread your wings. Yeah, spread my wings, yes. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think I'd make a forced landing in a hot shop. <laughs> but, Charlie, uh -huh. you're impulsive, you're irresponsible, you're selfish, and you have an exaggerated conception of the value of money. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the opinions expressed by Mr. Bergen are entirely his own. <laughs> Mr. Bergen, I don't think you like me as much as you used to. Well, you're mistaken about that, Charlie. Your latest episode has caused me a great deal of worry. It has? Yes. I lie awake night after night thinking of you. Do you, dear? All right. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason why we shouldn't get along much better than we do. Why, no, no, of course not. We have a lot in common. Yes, we have. Trouble is, you won't give me any of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you have your faults and I have mine. I agree with you there. And I'm willing to meet you halfway and admit that I am partly to blame. Well, that's fair enough. And I'll meet you halfway and admit that you are too. <laughs> well, I'm sure that you've learned one thing about your experiences. What's that? You've learned something about life. Yeah. It is a little complex, isn't it? Yeah. How true, how true. Life is so complicated... Better fellow would be lucky if... He looks very suspicious to me. Well, I can show you the lease if you're interested. And Mr. Madison did come back this morning. And he left again. I wanted to stay and... Well, here I am. Here we are. And, uh... Now, if you'll give me my letter, I'll be going. Mm, I hate to bring this up, but... There's just one more thing. What do you mean? The law. The law? Yes. You see, once a letter has been through the mail, it doesn't belong to the writer anymore. Oh, you must be wrong. I don't think so. Try thinking so. Sorry, but that's the way it is. Say, you're not a policeman or a judge or anything strict, are you? No, as a matter of fact, I'm an architect. Oh, well, they're never very strict. Wouldn't it help if I ordered a couple of houses? Mm, I'm afraid not. Oh. oh. Now, look. Look, if I told you that I wrote that letter on a mad impulse and that I want to get it back before Mr. Matheson reads it, what would you say? I'd say, why on earth didn't you tell me that before? And I'd give you the letter at once. 
Here, take it. Oh, oh, oh thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Shall we sit down? Yes, let's. <sighs> Have you ever had the mumps? The what? <laughs> mumps, you know, your cheeks puff up like this. No, uh, not recently. Why? Oh, nothing. It was true, you know, about that letter. I was running away. From uh, Mr. Matheson? Yes. We were engaged. Almost married, you might say, in the bar. Oh, dear, I dropped one. How silly of me. I'll get them. There we are. Now, uh, what about the other one? Which one? The one you didn't drop. I think you slipped it into your purse. How quick you are, Mr... Uh... Bustle. Yes, of course. May I have it? No. No, you see, this letter is mine. Is it addressed to you? No. Addressed by me. You see, I wrote it. Oh, you wrote it. You know, Mr. Hustle. Bustle. Mr. Bustle. <laughs> You're very annoying. I'm so sorry, but after all... Oh, uh... do you suppose I came here to steal the family jewels? Say, are you sure you've rented this place? Mr. Matheson was coming back today. Looks very suspicious to me. Well, I can show you the lease if you're interested. And Mr. Matheson did come back this morning. And he left again. I wanted to stay and... Well, here I am. Here we are. And, uh... Now, if you'll give me my letter, I'll be going. Mm, I hate to bring this up, but there's just one more thing. What do you mean? The law. The law? Yes. You see, once a letter has been through the mail, it doesn't belong to the writer anymore. Oh, you must be wrong. I don't think so. Try thinking so. Sorry, but that's the way it is. Say, you're not a policeman or a judge or anything strict, are you? No, as a matter of fact, I'm an architect. Oh, well, they're never very strict. Wouldn't it help if I ordered a couple of houses? Mm, I'm afraid not. It has? Yes. I lie awake night after night thinking of you. Do you, dear? All right. <laughs> There's no reason why we shouldn't get along much better than we do. Why, no, no, of course not. We have a lot in common. Yes, we have. Trouble is, you won't give me any of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have your faults and I have mine. I agree with you there. And I'm willing to meet you halfway and admit that I am partly to blame. Well, that's fair enough. And I'll meet you halfway and admit that you are too. <laughs> <laughs> well... I'm sure that you've learned one thing about your experiences. What's that? You've learned something about life. Yeah. It is a little complex, isn't it? Yeah. How true, how true. Life is so complicated that a fellow would be lucky if he wasn't born at all. <laughs> but that seldom happens. <laughs> Yes, Charlie, life is very complicated, and Tin Pan Alley is ready to sustain you. The blues are always popular, and ever more popular than when sung by Dorothy L'Amour. So we leave the blue tune, What's New, to Mademoiselle L'Amour. Days, until the next delivery. That's handling coffee like fresh food, which is exactly what this fine coffee is. Yes, from the time it's taken out of the roasting oven full of delicious flavor... Coffee of this high quality should be handled rapidly, and it is. It's packed at once. Put right in the dated silver packages and sent out to the stores. And all this speed in handling, plus the date on every pound, does away with the need for expensive containers. And that saves money. Exactly. We use the economical silver package and pass the saving along to your customers. And they appreciate it, too. It's the most popular coffee we've ever sold. Try it tomorrow. Get delicious, freshly roasted Chase and Sanborn coffee in the new dated silver package. <laughs> oh, boy, boy, boy. <laughs> My time is your time. 
Mortimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mustn't sing. Well, why not? We were playing. <laughs> I know, but that must make makes no difference. <laughs> yeah. Now, see, what were you doing back there in the corner with those earphones? You'll uh, have to try something else. Yeah, I have. I got an idea now that just can't miss. You see that basket over there? Oh, yes, I noticed that. It's full of letters, isn't it? Two hundred of them. And everyone is to Bergen demanding that he take me back. See? Excellent, excellent. So many letters are bound to impress Edgar. Oh, sure, can't miss now. Hello, Rudy. Hello, Edgar. Oh, hello, Mr. Bergen. What's that? Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Well, Rudy, it's nice being back together again. Oh, are we back together again? I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Hardly pays me to open my mouth around here. <laughs> Look, Edgar, I don't like to interfere, but it does seem to me that you're being a little too severe with Charlie. Rudy, all I can say is that I made an appointment with Charlie to be at my office Monday at 2 o'clock to talk over the matter of taking him back. And he didn't show up, nor did he bother to explain his absence. Now, Rudy, I appeal to you. Now, Rudy, I appeal oh, to oh, you. No, no, if no, you don't. Look here, this is strictly a private quarrel, and far be it for me to be the innocent bystander who gets kicked. Oh. <laughs> well, Charlie... Why weren't you at my office Monday? Oh, Monday. Yes. Uh, Monday, Monday. Uh, oh, I, I don't know. Everything went blank. I see. <laughs> well, haven't you even got an alibi? Uh, yes, I have. Yes, uh-huh. But I warn you, it won't stand much kicking around. No. John <laughs> Mortimer. I'm wearing shoes, too. <laughs> Why? You know, Mortimer, you're a sweeter boy as I've ever met. <laughs> You're so shy and uh, so polite and uh, so different. Well, I'm ignorant, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're just too darling for words, Mortimer. <clears throat> uh, you won't run away, will you? Nope, Mom, nope, nope. All right. Uh, See you later. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Now, Mortimer, would you like to meet our conductor, Robert Armbruster? Nope, nope. Well, why not? <laughs> I'd rather meet Dorothy Lamour again. Easy country, boy. <laughs> Lansing Hatfield sings the Pilgrim Song, a musical collaboration of the famous lyric by Leo Tolstoy, music by Tchaikovsky. Fall on this fair world On mountain, valley, forest, ocean yeah, In fact, I like everything about you You know, I think Mr. Matheson and Henry must be crazy too You do? Oh yes, I do You need someone who really appreciates you Someone, well, someone like me, for instance uh, Are you, are you proposing to me, Mr. I certainly am, uh, Bustle. <laughs> Bustle. No, no. Bob. Bettine, I'd like to marry you very much. Will you? Please? You think it would work out? Oh, I know it would. You seem very sure. I am sure. I've never been more sure of anything in my whole life. Bob? Yes? If we're going to forward my letter to Mr. Matheson, <laughs> we'll we'll have to hurry. <laughs> This is Rudy Valley, and the chase in San Bonauer continues. For one of the most novel treatments of a love song, the laurel wreath goes... You offer your hand, I understand, I do. Pardon my asking what you, of course, 
you couldn't know I haven't changed I still love you so Still want you so Want you As I traveled west last week, one thing that I saw along the way impressed me. It was the way fresh food is handled. From farmlands, coast to coast, crisp new vegetables, fresh eggs, and milk were being rushed to town. And going through the cities, I saw the trucks that carry another fresh food, coffee. Yes, to provide every city, village, and crossroads with Chase and Sanborn dated coffee at the height of its fine, rich, freshly roasted flavor... We've built modern roasting ovens from coast to coast. You mean there are roasting ovens in every section? Yes, ma'am. No matter where you live, there's a Chase and Sanborn roasting plant within 24 hours of your home. And our rapid fresh food delivery service... Lovely time it was, how sublime it was, too. I didn't know what day it was, you held my hand. Warm as the month of May it was And I'll say it was grand Grand to be alive, to be young, to be mad To be yours alone Grand to see your face, feel your touch Hear your voice, say I'm all your own I didn't know what year it was Life was no prize I wanted love and there it was Shining out of your eyes I'm wise For I know what time it is now Twilight in the desert is beautiful, isn't it? I knew it would be, but with you here, it's indescribably perfect. I never dreamed that anything like this existed. And now I don't want it to ever end. Me most, Charlie, is the way you left me. How? Ignoring my feelings entirely. Remember, Charlie, when we disregard the value of friendship, we have lost everything. Yeah. Yeah, I hate myself. I'm a cad, that's what I am, a cad. <laughs> However, even your experiences with the great Frederick should not be considered a failure. Well, I don't know what else you could call it. <laughs> well, you're no different than the average boy. When you went away, you left because you wanted adventure. Uh-huh. And because you wanted to uh, spread your wings. Yeah, spread my wings, yes. <laughs> I didn't think I'd make a forced landing in a hot shop. <laughs> but, Charlie? Uh-huh. You're impulsive, you're irresponsible, you're selfish, and you have an exaggerated conception of the value of money. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the opinions expressed by Mr. Bergen are entirely his own. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Bergen, I don't think you like me as much as you used to. Well, you're mistaken about that, Charlie. Your latest episode has caused me a great deal of worry. It has? Yes. I lie awake night after night thinking of you. Do you, dear? All right. (laughs) There's no reason why we shouldn't get along much better than we do. Why, no, no, of course not. We have a lot in common. Yes, we have. Trouble is, you won't give me any of it. (laughs) Well, you have your... Uh, uh, American. I I always feel a little touched. Yes, I think you are. A little. Oh, well, that's nice of you. Now, wait a minute, young man. I don't like your attitude. American history is American history, no matter what I say. You say. After all, who are you to insult my historical background? Well, perhaps because I happen to have a little historical background myself, Miss Vague, perhaps you'd be interested in knowing that my great-grandfather fought with General Braddock. My grandfather fought with General Grant, and my father fought with General Pershing. My goodness, what's the matter? Can't your folks get along with anybody? (laughs) 
In all modern songwriting history, there is no more successful to duo than my good friends Richard Rogers and Larry Hart. The For the George Abbott Show, Too Many Girls, the boys have supplied a refreshingly new treatment on an old theme called I Didn't Know What Time It Was. I'd like to voice their ideas on the subject. Once I was... You're not going to fool me with any of that phony letter stuff. You see? There you are, you see? How can you stoop so low? I don't know. (laughs) I guess we've been seeing too much of each other. (laughs) You know, there's around 200 letters there. All right, so there are 200 letters. Yes. So what? You had them made for around $2 a hundred. No, sir, you're wrong there, Mr. Bergen. Oh, am I? Yes. It was three dollars a hundred. Three dollars a hundred. Charlie, I don't know what course to take with you. Oh, take me back, will you, Bergen? Huh? Oh, go ahead, take me back, huh? Ah, oh, come on. Ah, oh. oh, come on, Bergen. Be a good sport, huh? Well, I want to do what is best for you. Well, then take me back. Ah, oh, take me back. Yeah. Well, what hurts me most, Charlie, is the way you left me. Oh. Ignoring my feelings entirely. Remember, Charlie, when we disregard the value of friendship, we have lost everything. Yeah. Hey, I hate myself. I'm a cad. That's what I am, a cad. <laughs> However, even your experiences with the great Frederick should not be considered a failure. Well, I don't know what else you could call it. <laughs> well, you're no different than the average boy. When you went away, you left because you wanted adventure. Uh-huh. And because you wanted to uh, spread your wings. Yeah, spread my wings, yes. <laughs> I didn't think I'd make a fortune. (laughs) Yes, you know, Gene, uh, uh, Mortimer's farm is uh, two miles south of Snurdville. And they have cows and chickens. We've got hogs, too. And hogs, too, you know. Do you raise any corn and potatoes? Nope, just hogs. Well, you prefer raising hogs. Yep, Mom, yeah. Why? Well, (laughs) you don't have to hoe hogs. No, no. I'll bet you Snurdville is a right big town by Cracky. Hey, Mortimer? Yeah. Well, we don't say by cracking. <laughs> <laughs> That's very small townish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we got a grocery store in Snurdville. Well, just imagine that. Snurdville has a grocery store. Yeah, it's hard to believe, yeah. yeah. That's where I go for excitement. Excitement? Yeah. In a grocery store? Sure, sure. Well, I swan. Yeah. What do you do there? I watch the man run the new bacon slicer. <laughs> oh, boy, riggy diggy. Oh, boy, riggy diggy. <laughs> that is exciting. Yep, 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 Mom. When I get tired of that, you know what I do? No, what? Uh, should I tell her? <laughs> I think it's safe. I go down to the depot about 7 o'clock. <laughs> oh, you go down to the depot? Depot. Uh, depot, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> About seven o'clock. Yeah, and I'll watch the 410 come in. Oh, I... 